when you grow up as a very young child with things like physical abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, abandonment, those types of experiences for a young child, your brain doesn't know the difference between running from a tiger or that. Okay, so what happens is they, when they did the studies, the brains of children who grow up in trauma are very similar to the brains of a soldier coming back from war. They look the same as far as the emotional centers in their brains. They're fired up. They're constantly on because they're always looking for that tiger around the corner. You never know when it's going to jump out. I didn't know when my uncle, who was a heroin addict, was going to be high and have his friends over when there was going to be needles. I didn't know if the police were coming to the door to say, oh, your uncle's been murdered and everyone's going to be screaming in the house that day. I didn't know, you know, when the next thing was going to happen or if I was going to be left alone. I'd wake up and be alone in the house. I was two years old and almost drowned because I was left alone in the house. I was saved by my German shepherd. Welcome to Successful with ADHD. I'm Brooke Schnittman. Let's get started. Welcome, Tanya, to Successful with ADHD. It's so nice to have you. Thank you, Brooke. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah. So I'm sure for those of you tuning in right now, you have heard of Tanya Amen, and she is a, a BSN, an RN, a New York Times bestselling author and trauma nurse. She also has ADHD, everyone. So um, <laughs> we, we're we going to go there. And she is a vice president of Amen Clinics. She is a world-renowned health and fitness expert. She's won the heart of millions with her simple yet effective strategies to help people optimize their lifestyle and win the fight for their strong body, mind, and spirit. And speaking of fighting, she holds a second degree black belt <laughs> in Kenpo Karate and a black belt in Taekwondo. Wow, my uh, <laughs> stepson is going to be so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> so much fun. Yeah. So don't mess with her. All right. <laughs> She's she's figured it out internally and physically, so you can't beat her up. <laughs> her husband is Dr. Amen, and she and Dr. Amen have four children and five grandchildren. So so welcome to Thank Successful you. with ADHD. Yeah. Thank you. Is there anything else that I missed that you wanted to share about yourself? I think you covered a lot. I'm sure Laura is okay. going to come out as we do our interview. So um, yes. why don't we jump in and then All right. you know, a lot more is going to come up. So. Let's do it. Let's do it. So Tanya, you have quite the history and I know that you recently came out with a book talking about that. And wow, it's called The Relentless Courage of a, a Scared Child. So for those of you who don't know, you have had an abusive childhood. So yeah, would you mind sharing like what the tipping point was for you with that and how you got all of that out into your book? You know, it's so interesting. Like so many people who have been through what I've been through with childhood trauma, they it's a sign of resilience when you say to yourself it 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 wasn't as bad as other people. But when you start talking about it, you're like, "Wait, well, there's kind of a lot there." My husband that first brought it up, he kept looking at me and his eyes kept getting bigger. He's like, okay, wow. <laughs> I'm like, okay, wait, for a shrink to say that, that's a little weird. So he's like, you've been through a lot. He said, you're amazing. He's like, but I, you probably could benefit from processing some of this. And I remember thinking at the time that he said that, I, this is why I didn't want to date a shrink. <laughs> so, like I was like, literally. Stop just, psychoanalyzing me. Don't psychoanalyze me. So I was because I had a very strong facade built up. Um, I didn't want people to see beyond it. I was very good at creating a facade of I'm like a perfectionist. I'm a perfectionist. My life is all together. It could do the makeup, the hair, the clothes. And people had a tendency to look at me and go, well, how, what would you know about my life? Your life is perfect. So not perfect. But I was really good at creating that facade because the truth is, it wasn't perfect. I grew up, my mother was a 16-year-old runaway. She never finished high school. She lived on the streets for a while. So education and resources were not a thing in my family when I was young. Sure. And she did the best she could. She really did. She was. She had a lot of grit. She worked really hard. She was not an addict, but she was very codependent and tried to fix everybody and think that she mm -hmm. was the one that had to heal the world. And as a result, brought a lot of people into my home that shouldn't have been there with the young child. 
including my uncle, who was a heroin addict, and my other uncle was murdered in a drug deal because of that uncle. Wow. Yeah, and then some of the men she picked were, <laughs> let's just say, less than ideal. Um, so she didn't have a good And that was men. all in front of you. Oh, not just in front of me. My first stepdad climbed in bed with me. So I was one of the very lucky ones who was able to fight and get away from him. But the story was very dramatic, and it's, it's in my book. The second one was more emotionally and verbally, um, let's just say it was very, he, his nickname for me was Sexy Bitch. And just the way he talked to me was not a way you talk to a child. Oh, um, gosh. And so that was very odd. Um, lots happened. I was left alone a lot. I was, there was a lot of neglect. My dad left when I was very young. My dad was a Baptist minister, by the way, who did drugs with my uncle and my half-sisters who were 10 years younger than I was. It's quite oh, my- a story. Gosh, so, I could go on and on, but I won't. I won't go on and on. There's more, way more in the book. And believe it or not, the book is sort of the PG-13 version because the people are all still alive. Wow. Yeah, it was interesting. But I developed an eating disorder in my teens. Eating disorders are very different for everybody. For me, it was clearly anxiety related. It was like okay. I could not make sense or get any sense of footing or control in my crazy world. And it was... I would just, my anxiety would just get out of control. And that was how I mm-hmm. managed it. And that eventually transferred into extreme exercise because I knew I couldn't maintain the eating disorder behavior. It, at least for me, I had enough control that I switched it over into exercise, like very intense exercise. And that was like a pressure release for a valve for me. And I didn't know it was actually also good for ADD. Did you know that you had ADHD at the time? Oh, I didn't even believe in ADHD. Did not believe in it whatsoever. Um, That's a whole other reason. It's when you date a shrink. (laughs) That's the whole story. (laughs) So did he diagnose you with ADHD? So he didn't diagnose me. He suggested that I might think about the fact that maybe it, you know, like I have ADHD and I'm like, absolutely not. It's total nonsense because I actually was pretty successful. Mm -hmm. And so I did really well in school, which is not typical of someone with ADHD because they get very distracted. But school for me was where I sort of put my energy. And also, there's different types of ADD. So different types of ADD. I wasn't hyperactive ever. I didn't have the H in the ADHD. Okay, so I wasn't hyperactive. I was Mm over-focused. So I have this tendency, I would have a tendency to be very, very over-focused, almost like OCD-ish with certain things, but at the expense of other things. Mm -hmm. So like my closet, don't don't go in my closet. (laughs) But when I get (laughs) focused on something, I'm laser-focused on it. Mm-hmm. So and I can get anxious because of my childhood and my background. And that's trauma. Sure. It's a very different type of ADD. Yeah. So when I had Dr. Eamon on the podcast, he was telling me that you had that type of ADHD right. and it can look like OCD. And I'm I not- obviously am not a doctor, but from what I'm hearing, it sounds with anxiety, the trauma that brings in that obsessive thinking and that anxious Mm -hmm. thinking where you have to control something right so So you're opening this whole other thing about childhood trauma so a lot of people don't realize that when you grow up with childhood they're called adverse childhood experiences or aces um for anybody Mm -hmm. who has not heard of that they've been studied a lot primarily because people who have like a certain level of childhood adverse childhood experiences they not only get sick more they die earlier and so these, this has been studied a lot, and they started to scale it. There's a scale mm-hmm. of 0 to 10. You can actually go online and look up ACE scores, adverse childhood experience. You have that on your link tree, I believe. Yeah, you can look it up, take the quiz. I'm an 8 out of 0 to 10. My nieces are a 9, so we adopted them because they're my family. And so we ended up adopting them. And so when you grow up in an environment like that where when you're a child, it's, it's the reason they do it is children there's a lot of things not included in that so for example i was actually assaulted on the street walking to high school when i was 15 that's not part of the ace accumulation this is only what happens inside your house so wow they figure that that is what they're they considered within this because when you grow up as a very young child with things like physical abuse sexual abuse death of someone in a traumatic way in your family incarceration neglect you know abandonment Those types of experiences for a young child, your brain doesn't know the difference between running from a tiger or that. Okay, so what happens is they when they did the studies, the brains of children who grow up in 
trauma are very similar to the brains of a soldier coming back from war. They look the same as far as the emotional centers in their brains. They're fired up. They're constantly on because they're always looking for that tiger around the corner. You never know when it's going to jump out. I didn't know when my, you know, uncle who was a heroin addict was going to be high and have his friends over when there was going to be needles. I didn't know if the police were coming to the door to say, oh, your uncle's been murdered and everyone's going to be screaming in the house that day. I didn't know, you know, when the next thing was going to happen or if I was going to be left alone. I'd wake up and be alone in the house. I was two years old and almost drowned because I was left alone in the house. I was saved by my German shepherd. It's kind of crazy. Um, oh so you don't know gosh. when those things are going to happen. So you're always on alert. But when that happens as a child, it's different than as an adult. Yes, adults need to get therapy for things like that. You can do totally therapy. But as a child, it actually changes your brain development. And so here's the, here's the rub. When you are constantly bathed with stress hormones and cortisol, as a child with a developing brain, it changes your brain development and it does things. So the four major things that happen, it's probably more, but these are the four major ones that I know of. It affects your frontal lobe development. So you have decreased function in your frontal lobes. That's the definition of ADHD. ADHD, right. I, I see ADD sometimes because I'm not hyperactive and a lot of people aren't. So that's right. the only reason you'll hear me use them interchangeably. Um, so ADD or ADHD, your memory center is affected. So you have more trouble with certain memory things. Now, the funny thing is, is you'll hold on to the negative things in your life. You, like those types of memories, you'll never forget. It's so in the front of your, and that's the first thing that you think of when a new situation occurs, right? Absolutely. And then you also have, so it's memory center, frontal lobes, your hip, so your hippocampus, which is going to help with, that's with the memory center, but your amygdala. So your amygdala will get fired up and it's like you're stuck in fight or flight all the time. So that's why you're always looking over your shoulder. You're, you're always waiting for the shoe, the other shoe to fall. You don't trust people. I definitely don't trust people. That's what happens to a developing brain. But the first thing I mentioned was the frontal lobes. And that's why so many people who grow up in those environments have issues with ADHD. And it's just one of the reasons. Yeah. Yes. It's one of the reasons I completely hear you. So I spoke to Dr. Gabor Mate. He thinks that trauma is the cause of ADHD. And when I speak to other experts in the field, like Dr. Hallowell, he said it's one of the causes one of ADHD, cause. right? But like, I would also challenge it even further and say everyone with ADHD has experienced some sort of trauma. How could they have not? Not to the point where you have. But everyone experiences it in different ways, right? You know, I don't know. I don't know if I can answer that other than I don't know if I can answer that one. If they have ADHD that they automatically experience trauma, I'm not quite sure, except that they probably struggle with things a little more. And that, yeah. that can be very difficult for people. So I'm not I, I don't know that I can answer that. But I, I just know that that it does lend itself to ADHD. And I also do know what you just said is really important, though. I don't I don't know that it's the only cause because I know one of the things that led to my issue with ADHD, the, the affected frontal lobes. And this was something my husband did see. He kept asking me if I had a head injury. So when he scanned me two weeks after I met him. <laughs> Is that his requirement? Yes. But you have to understand, what, he, he looked at my scan and he's like, when, when did you have a head injury? I'm like, I've never had a head injury. My definition wow. of a head injury as a neurosurgical ICU level A trauma nurse and my husband's idea of a head injury were very different. So for me, head injury meant you had part of your skull missing, you have brain tissue hanging out, you have a brain drain, you've got like, that's what I see. You're in a coma. That's sure. my idea of a head injury. So that's what I saw on a daily basis. For him, head injury, small traumatic, small traumatic hits to the head, head injuries that are daily things that you don't lose consciousness for. Those are what ruin people's lives. And so he kept looking at me. He's like, nope, I can see it right there. And he's like, ever, did you ever fall out of a tree? No. Did you ever fall off your bike? No. And he kept going through this list and he got to car accident. I'm like, well, yeah, hasn't everybody had a car accident? Like, you know, but I didn't lose consciousness. And he's mm -hmm. like, everyone happened. And so my sister was um, the one who did drugs. Should have known. I did not know she had dropped acid the night before. Would have been a good piece of information to know. Anyways, oh she, my yeah. Oh, the It was morning, so I didn't think about it. I didn't think about her having been, you know, on drugs. So when she was young, we were driving and she was going 75 miles an hour, fell asleep at the wheel, flipped the car two and a half times. And the 
the roof of the car caved in. I was just, I was so grateful. I was laying back in the seat. And so my head hit the console, but I didn't lose consciousness and I walked away from the accident. So I was just so grateful to walk away from the accident that I just thought it was great, right? I didn't think of it as a head injury. <laughs> you left and you, you had no cuts, you had no bruises. No, and he's like, well, I can see it on your scan. So, you know. Wow. So when your husband, when you guys were dating at two weeks, he scanned your brain. He saw essentially a traumatic brain injury and uh, a lot of amygdala activity. Oh, yeah. So he saw my frontal lobes decreased more from the, the hit to the head. You could see where the hit to the head was because the left temporal lobe was affected also. And then also my fired up emotional center. And so he's wow. like, there's also some emotional trauma here. But the minute he brought up the ADD, I'm like, I, that is nonsense. It's an excuse to fail. It's an excuse for people not to try. I like, he's like, we think thou dost protest too much. So, um, so that was an interesting Take it down a notch. <laughs> uh, so uh, it was an interesting conversation. And the one thing I will say, um, I, I really did not believe it. Funny enough, my mother didn't either. My mother, like, 100% did not believe in ADD. She thought it was complete nonsense. My mother has ADD from hell. I mean, like way worse than I ever imagined having. If you look at her, she has no frontal lobes. The woman ended up retiring very wealthy, like very successful, which was against all odds, just because she has pure grit. My dad, on the other hand, who claimed he had ADD his whole life, that's probably why I was so defensive because I wasn't, I, my, my dad and I didn't. You were, had a negative association. Absolutely. He would use it as an excuse not to do anything. And so he didn't have ADD. When we scanned him, he did not have ADD. But he always claimed he did. And so that was part of my issue. But sure. my mother and I both had ADD. We wow. were both very successful. But the one thing that I will say, yes, I was successful. Yes, my mother was successful. But after I began to understand the brain of someone with ADHD, so once I understood what ADD does and how to treat it with some of the natural things and we're not anti-medication, we just want you to be doing the natural things. And if that doesn't work, then, you know. The right medication for the right brain. But once I was doing those things, I did not realize that I actually had a lot more potential. Yeah, I was successful, but it was much easier to be successful. And I ended up writing 10 books in nine years. Now, I'm not saying whatever your successful is. I'm just saying it's much easier to get from point A to point B. I didn't realize that it didn't need to be that hard. Wow. So what did you do then to write 10 books in nine years and be able to get from point A to, let's say, point Z <laughs> instead of B? <laughs> so honestly, one of the things I was already doing, I didn't know I was like sort of medicating myself with the exercise, but I was also medicating myself with almost two pots of coffee a day because I was a trauma nurse working late, you know, so that wasn't a good thing. But the exercise was very good. I had to tone it down a little bit. So like doing the right exercise is good, not overdoing it. Getting the trauma treated was huge. I mean, huge. The most important thing I did in my life was getting the trauma treated. If you don't heal from what hurt you, you bleed on people who didn't cut you, right? So that was probably the most important thing. But also some simple supplements really helped me. We make a blend, but really what it is, it's ashwagandha, ginkgo, like some things like that, fish oil. Those types of supplements can be so helpful for helping you just naturally increase blood flow to your brain. Meditation, like meditation, learning how to calm myself down in a situation and reframe things, just getting control of my own mind was so critical. And food, I, like I can't even begin. That's why I wrote the books. Food is so important when it comes to focus and mood. And people don't realize that what you eat, everything you put on the end of your fork matters. Because it affects not only your mood, but your decision making from moment to moment. And it's that it's that moment to moment decision making that determines your success or your failure. So it's it's you know, that stacking. It's the little stuff. It's not the big decisions always. Yes. It's little stuff on a consistent basis. And that's why you said from A to B. And I'm glad that you said consistent basis because I've had a lot of conversation about consistency with ADHD. And so many people think that we can't be consistent, but it's not true. If we take care of ourselves and we really, really have the motivation to do something and we know, you know, what's too much, like in the exercise piece for you is too much, and we just do a little bit 
every day and just try, that's consistent. Even if it's not to Z, like you said. I'm a pretty intense person, hence the martial arts. So I used to be a person who was like, you can't jump a canyon in two small steps. You can't do it. Do it all. And I learned that that's not how most people make change. I mean, over time and maturity and just learning, I think age just has a lot to do with it. I've learned most people make change in, in increments, small increments. Sometimes you have to really chunk down for people. It's just it it just makes it easier because they feel like failures otherwise, especially people with ADHD. They will sure. try and try and try, and then they have this learned helplessness because it doesn't work. And so I would challenge you, rather than saying it doesn't work or I'm a failure, maybe the way you did it doesn't work. As opposed to it, you can't do it. Maybe how you did it wasn't working for you. And you just try scaling back. So when I'm coaching someone and they say something like, I can't do it, it's like, you can't do it that way. Okay, so why don't we try a li something a little different? And people are like, I, it just feels overwhelming. I just can't get up and go work out for an hour every day. I just can't do it. Okay, that's okay. Put your uh, shoes on. You put your shoes by the door. Right. But Or go for a 10-minute walk. Just go for a 10-minute walk. Don't make it such a big thing in your head. Because I promise you, once you start doing the one thing and you master that, you will start to build on it. We actually, Daniel and I created this chart of 50 brain healthy habits. Yeah. And the reason we did it is because we started thinking about our kids. Like my daughter, when she was growing up, I had a chore chart, right? You check them off as you do them. But the, the premise behind the 50 things is pick one, pick one a week. So not any particular one, whichever one seems the easiest to you that you think you can master for an entire week. And if you haven't mastered it at the end of the week, that's okay. Do it for another week. But and don't overthink which one you're going to pick. Don't overthink it. <laughs> Just pick. Once you feel like you can do that with no effort, pick another one. Keep doing that one. Pick another one. Add it on and just check them off. And by the end of the year, you will be shocked. And your tra trajectory of how much you have changed just skyrockets. Yes. Oh, my gosh. I share that with ADHDers who we all experience chaos. And it's that prioritization. What do I do first? How do? What's the first step? Just literally mind map, brainstorm, anything that's on your mind and pick one thing and break it down. Like you said, chunk it really, really small. And it doesn't matter what you do first. Just do Absolutely. something. I love that. Absolutely. I love that. So you have ADHD. You have a lot of PTSD. What kind of therapy, if you don't mind sharing, did you partake in to work on the trauma piece? So I'm one of those people my husband calls a seeker. I will literally do anything. I'll throw the kitchen sink at it if I think it will work. I'm skeptical of everything, but I will try anything that I think might work. So the thing that was the most effective for me for the trauma part was um, EMDR, for sure, 100% for the trauma, 100%. That was his first gift to me when we were dating was 10 sessions of EMDR. Again, a little weird, but you know, what do you expect? So um, I was like, you think I'm really messed up. But he's like, no, I think you're amazing. I <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. I ended up doing it for two years because it was so amazing. And I had never, I had always been resistant to therapy because I'm like, I'm not going to go do a bunch of psychobabble, bang my head up against a wall and just talk about my problems. It's just not me. I'm going to go beat something up. And that's just mm -hmm. like, take action, go to the gym and go beat something up and, you know, do martial arts or whatever, which by the way, is still great there. But EMDR is different than that. It's like a shortcut because it helps your brain process trauma that gets stuck. So it's eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing. That's the name of it. And so emotional trauma literally gets stuck in your brain, in the amygdala. So what this does is it helps with the bilateral movement of the eyes. What it does is it helps to reprocess that trauma while you're thinking of the negative memory. Then they move you, the, an experienced therapist will move you through that. I don't really understand the whole premise behind it, but what they do is they move you through it until it no longer holds that sting or that power over you. And then you reprocess it into what you'd rather have. So it's very powerful. And pretty soon it doesn't have the power over you. And then mm -hmm. my other technique that I love for making change is NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. But that's more of a for making changes in your life quickly. And that is powerful and it works really well. But I'm really a fan of like, to seeking out what works for you. Like I'm really a big fan of doing things. One of my favorite things is just hanging out with people who are smarter than me, quite frankly, because people are contagious. So mastermind groups, 
when you're around people who are successful, who are powerful, there's something contagious about it. You want to be better. Oh, yeah. And you also get that dopamine kick, right? But after you go to that mastermind, you're like, I got to tackle a million things. But then the logical part of your brain is saying, wait, just pick one, but it has to be small. Do I have the time for it? But yes, it is so exciting. But you have an entire group lifting you. And when you yes. can't what to do, like your ADD, ADD brain gets stuck, you have a group you're reaching out to who's been there. They've done it. And it's like, so that yes. really elevates people. Yes. And that accountability. So EMDR, I love it too. It's amazing. And you don't have that physiological response that you used to have with the trauma that you experienced before. So I would imagine that when you're, you know, experiencing something new, it's not, and I don't know where the, the physiological response was for you, but it's just different. You have more calm. It's very different, but I also have more awareness. So, you know, we used to say we had something on speed dial. Now you say it's on your favorites. I keep my therapist. I still, when something really triggers me, I recently got triggered again. It's now having the awareness that you need help. So now I don't wait. So now it's like I'm preemptive and proactive. Mm -hmm. So when we adopted my two nieces, it just a, was a horrible story. We got them out of foster care. You can imagine. Sure. So it was pretty awful. And I, it re-triggered a whole lot of trauma from my past. And so there was a lot of anger that I had towards my sister. So I really needed to do some work around that. And mm -hmm. so I automatically, before I let it become a thing, I did the work with that and called my my therapist and just started working on it because I don't want to bring that into my house. Yes, yes, I love that. So you know what you need and you feel so much better once going through that. So instead of stacking more trauma on top of that emptiness or new feeling that you have, you just nip it in the bud, which is great. And you coach too. So I do, but I tell now, me about I that. I don't want one anymore. I used to teach classes. And it was so much fun. But I think we've just gotten to a point where it's a little more challenging now to do that. So mostly I write books. I'm very active on social media. I love providing free information. I, you know, it's sort of my way of giving back. Yes, we have clinics. People come see us from all over the world. Not everybody can come see us. And I, I get yeah. that. So we do have a foundation where we try to help people who want to come see us and can't. We're working really hard to build that foundation up so we can treat more people. But there's always like free information on my website and on my social media. It's, you know, just something I can do. All the free quizzes that you have. I actually yeah. just took uh, the one on your website and it was a type eight for my brain. Yeah. And it, I'm sure you're probably the same, um, but and, it was showing. <laughs> and now I'm a type one. So stop that it. Naturally a type one? I'm not naturally a type one. I'm a type one because I work at it. So the meditation, the supplements, the exercise, the food. Now I'm more of a type one. So if I stopped doing all that, I wouldn't be a type one by nature. That's not how yeah. it works. Right? Wow. So the nurture that you provide your brain is really changing your brain, which is like a muscle, which is Absolutely. incredible. You're rewiring your brain. Right. So tell me, you have ADHD. Your husband does not. What's that like for you? being married to someone who knows all the ins and outs. You've already shared some of the things, but what is that like for you to have an expert in ADHD who doesn't have ADHD and you have ADHD? So if I'm really honest, I'm really lucky, but that's the only reason I'm so lucky, I think, is because he's so psychologically savvy and because he's him. I'm very yang. He's very yin. It seems like maybe that wouldn't be a good match, but it really is because he he's my ground. He's my rock. I'll come in just all fired up about something. And it, like literally we're fire and water. And he's just like, it's going to be okay on it. I'm like, no, it's not. Yes, it is. It's all going to be okay. We're all going to die someday. Like not today. We're, it's all going to be okay. Like, you know, so, so it's, he, he really calms me down, but he's also very psychologically savvy. So he doesn't, he's not one of those people who rubs it in my face because I have AD. Like that would not work. Sure. He's, if anything, he really helps me to be my best version of myself. So I'm really fortunate with that. I don't think everybody is going to be like that. Sometimes, you know, opposites don't blend that well. But I've also learned how to maximize my potential along with his help. But also on my own, I've like sort of figured out like writers write and fighters fight. So these mm -hmm. are my weaknesses. These are my strengths. So in my case, I'm actually a fighter and a writer. But um, I was going to say, <laughs> how does that work? <laughs> but find your weaknesses. So for me, like I said, don't go in my closet. Like I'm just not, and my husband would joke that I've never, never met a cabinet door I want to close. So that's, 
like organization in my space isn't always my my top priority. But what's really funny is I'm a little OCD about it. Like it will bother me. Like stuff out of place bothers me. But my ADD brain can like not do it myself sometimes when I'm busy. So I'm really good at surrounding myself with people who are helpful. So like my assistant at work, I'm so busy. I'm traveling. I'm doing these things. I surround myself with people who their strengths are my weaknesses. I weaknesses. surround myself. Like my assistant is OCD. You know what I mean? So like that's perfect. He compliments my ADD. So that's what I mean by that. Writers write and fighters fight. I don't beat myself up for not being that person. I'm actually fine with it. I actually figured out how to be way more successful in my life when I stopped beating myself up for it, when I stopped thinking I should do everything perfectly. For me, it was like, yes, I'm going to optimize my potential. I'm going to do the best I can. But where I'm not strong, I'm going to really focus on being successful here because guess what? Then I can afford to hire someone to help me over here. Isn't that so the best? It just works better for me. Obviously, this is a journey. And like you said, there are certain things that happen that can trigger you and you got to go back to EMDR. Well, you don't have to, but you choose to go back to mm -hmm. EMDR. When would you say you started to see positive change in yourself after starting to do EMDR and changing the way that you eat and lessening the amount of workouts that you did? So with the food, it's almost immediate you're going to start to notice a decrease in inflammation and an improvement in focus and energy almost immediately. So you'll have like a three-day brain fog thing and then you break the sugar addiction and then you start to feel better almost immediately. With the EMDR, <laughs> um, that can get a little bit sticky. The healing starts right away. But I think a lot of people can describe it as like, oof, it's like a sweater unraveling. Sometimes this one thing you didn't realize was connected to something else. So this one memory, for some people, if it's only one or two traumatic events, like they did a study on police officers and shootings. That one traumatic event, after eight sessions, they were dramatically better. But if it's a lifetime or 18 years or 20 years or whatever it is of trauma, that could take mm -hmm. a little longer. So I did it for two years because what would happen is that one, that one memory that I thought I had was connected to something else. So yeah, I, gotcha. I would sort of like process that memory and I'm like, I didn't even realize like it was connected to this other thing over here. You know what I mean? Like, so... It sort of is like the sweater unraveling and you have to be patient enough to work through it. So it can feel like it's almost worse before it's better in some ways. And then all of a sudden mm -hmm. you wake up one day and you're like, wow, I feel like I'm full circle. Like you just feel light. Yeah. So you're riding the wave essentially. Some days uh -huh. suck and some days are okay. And then all of a sudden the wave crashes and you're feeling like. Yes. And what I want to really point out, healing never happens in a straight line. Anyone who follows my husband has heard him say this. It's not a straight line trajectory. It's you get, you feel better and you're really excited. And then all of a sudden you don't feel as good. And then you feel better. And then you have a bad day and then you feel better. So as long as the overall trajectory, you're going to have bad days in there. But as long as the overall trajectory, in fact, you might drop not all the way down, but down far from one day. As long as you're not dropping below baseline, okay? And you're going back up. And so eventually mm -hmm. you notice that you're getting to this high point even with those bad days. So you don't want to look at the, the necessary, you want to be looking at the trajectory and you want to notice the bad days. And we always say turn bad days into good data. Pay attention. What's going on? Learn from what's happening on those days. So you eat for your brain. You take supplements for your brain. The number one question I get from clients is, what supplement should I take for my ADHD brain? And I'm like, you know, there are supplements out there that improve focus. Um, I know you have L-thionine on your website. And you have to know what you works for your body, right? right. I know what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, okay. it, it's not one thing. People write to me all the time. They want to know my supplement routine and I won't tell them. Because Smart. your supplement routine, supplements are not just innocuous. They actually do something. And so otherwise you shouldn't be taking them. Okay. So yes, there are some maybe that are less so than others, but when you take certain supplements, they can have a, an effect on you. For example, I should have known better. I did know better. But when my daughter was young, I figured she had my brain. She was like, she was sort of behaving in a way that was driving me a little crazy. So I'm like, oh, she has ADD. So I gave her supplements for ADD and she was worse. And I'm like, what is going on? My husband looked at me, he goes, cause she doesn't have ADD. She has OCD. I was like, no, she doesn't. Yes, she does. We scanned her. She had OCD. So you don't want to take the wrong thing. 
ADD is not the same for everybody. Like I said, I don't have the hyperactive part. What I have is sleepy frontal lobes and very overactive emotional brain. So what I need to do is something that calms down that emotional brain, but stimulates my frontal lobes, right? Mm -hmm. Which is why people like me reach for caffeine, but that can actually fire up your emotional brain. So you want to know that. Um, so mm -hmm. taking the quiz, brain health, we have a quiz, free quiz, brainhealthassessment.com <clears throat> can help you know your type and can give you some suggestions as to what might be beneficial to you. Because some people... Their, their brains are very overactive like mine. It looks like OCD, but they actually do have a form of ADD or vice versa. There are people with anxiety that can look depressed or that's my point. You want to actually know what it is because what you would take for depression, we don't like that diagnosis. It's not a diagnosis. Someone who has a more sad appearance mm -hmm. would be different than something you would take for someone who has a more just hyperactive, like overactive, like their brains that, like racing sure. thoughts that's going to be very different so if it's a fired up emotional brain and so that's why we want you to take the quiz so if you have traditionally impulsive if you're traditionally impulsive you make bad decisions you you're more you know sleepy frontal lobes brain fog traditionally that would be something more like stimulating like green tea um extract without the caffeine ginkgo ashwagandha like those types of things are really great Someone with more sad affect would be saffron can be very helpful. Okay. You know, what's so interesting with that being said, I thought that D vitamin D, I needed to take D3. And I just met with a naturopathic doctor and I took a bunch of tests. He said, you don't need a vitamin D supplement. It's like, come on. He goes, no, you, you have enough vitamin D. Oh, interesting. Right. Well, I live in Florida. I want out of like, so few that. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> You're fun. I do. I okay, do. and you're fair. I, so that's yes. why. So you're okay. fair, right? And also yeah. your diet matters. So you're fair. You're in the sun. People, the darker your skin, the less you absorb vitamin D. Mm. Um, so the more fair okay. you are, if you're getting some some form of sun, even if it's mornings, like that's actually the best sun, early morning sun, um, because it's not going to damage the skin, but you're going to get vitamin D. So. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, I was very skeptical about that. But I'm like, really? I don't need to take vitamin D. I've been taking it my whole life. I thought I need 5,000. Yeah, no, you don't need anything. Okay, fine. Save me but money. Check regularly. <laughs> I can change depending on the time you yes. checked. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. So you have given us so many tools, whether, you know, with diet, EMDR, exercise, meditation, and just how, how change happens over time. What would be the number one thing that you would share and suggest to people listening who have ADHD and trauma to help them? I know that's very broad. Well, obviously, I'm going to say identify and treat the trauma. That's going to be the number one thing. The other thing would be have some grace with yourself. I think there's a lot of shame that people hold on to if they've had trauma in their past and they have ADD and they've made bad decisions. When I was writing my book, The Relentless Courage of the Scared Child, childhood trauma was easier to address. It was painful, but easier to address because it's like, oh, well, that wasn't my fault. I wasn't responsible for that. When it got to be in my 20s and I was making bad decisions, yeah, that's self-induced trauma. And that can be a lot trickier because there's shame around that. And so people have a harder time wanting to address it because it's painful. So I would say have grace with yourself. And, you know, the, the saying of going back to your younger self it's it's such a cliche, but it really like how would you talk to your daughter? How would you talk to a best friend? Why not talk that way to yourself, right? <laughs> and just have some grace. Um, I like to go to my future self as well, and it's like, oh, if I were my future self, and I came back to me now, like what would I say about the future? Like that's kind of a cool exercise to do too. But I think having grace with yourself and letting go of shame. It reminds me so much of Elaine on Seinfeld. I don't know if you're a Seinfeld fan, but that one episode where she was like, do I have any grace? No, you have no grace. <laughs> She's like, we not even a little bit of grace. Ourselves. Yeah, no, we are so mean to ourselves. We like, really are. Never talk to other people the way we talk to ourselves. Yes, yes. And what is one thing that you would say to your child if you as a child before knowing what you know now? Wait, wait, just wait. Your life is going to be amazing. Like, 
this is this might be painful now. I think the one thing that I like to coach people with is my childhood was rough. My 20s were worse. Um, there was a time I didn't want to be on the planet. It was rough. And I got really depressed after I had cancer. I thought I was wasting oxygen on the planet. So I think wow. that was the hardest time in my life. And if I could tell anybody anything, that time where I literally didn't see a purpose for life, you don't always realize how fast it can actually change. It actually turned around fairly quickly, which seemed impossible possible to me at the time. But what I didn't know is that the pain that I had then would be the platform that I have now for helping people. So pain to purpose is a big thing for me. That's that's one of my major platforms is just pain to purpose. I just got chills. Yeah, if I could tell anybody anything, it's like you just don't know what tomorrow can bring. And I can see that that's still having a, yeah. a physiological response on you. Yeah. So you are really a powerhouse, your role model for people who are going through traumatic events, who have ADHD, who are dealing with, um, you know, body dysmorphia, nutrition issues. So I know you give so much free information and you're reaching large millions of people out there. Can you just share for those listening now, and we'll put it in the show notes too, where people can find you on social media, on links, how to take your free quiz? Absolutely. So my website is tanaamon.com and there's all kinds of free recipes there. For the quiz, it's brainhealthassessment.com. You can also find that on my website or on BrainMD. That's our supplement line. I'm very active on Instagram. So Tana Amon, it's just at Tana Amon. Thank you so much, Tana, for coming on. It's a pleasure. And I wish you all the best on your moves. I know that is not fun with ADHD. So one, one box at a time. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Brooke. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to this episode of Successful with ADHD. I hope it helps you on your journey. And if you need any additional support for you or a loved one with ADHD, Feel free to reach out to us at coachingwithbrooke.com and all social media platforms at Coaching with Brooke. And remember, it's Brooke with an E. Thanks again for listening. See you next time. Bye.